Um, so virtualization is a really great technology, right? And I'm sure everybody in this room agrees that KVM is a fantastic hypervisor, right? Um, the thing about virtualization is that it comes with a cost. And one of those costs is performance. So my name is Christopher Dell. I work on KVM Arm for uh, Linaro. I'm presenting joint work that I did with Shiwei Li from Columbia University. And this work is really something I came up with in an attempt to not be reviewing Mark's patches all the time, but to write some patches that he then gets to review. So today I'm going to talk about how we've significantly redesigned and re-implemented core parts of KVM ARM to improve performance. So if we go back to 1974 um, and look at one of these sort of fundamental papers about virtualization from Popek and Goldberg, they said that a virtual machine is an efficient isolated duplicate of a real machine. And when they talked about efficiency, they basically were saying that if you execute most of your instructions natively on the CPU without having to trap to the hypervisor, then you're good and you're efficient. But the thing is that that was written in a time when computers looked something like this. So that's a IBM 360. This happens to be from uh, the Columbia University computer room where I went to school, but roughly 40 years before my time. But that's not actually really fair because they also talk about a PDP-10 in their paper. Uh, like this one, but this one is actually too new one to compare with what they're talking about. Because what they, they were talking about, they were talking about one with a K10 CPU that had a whopping 1K maximum amount of addressable memory and no paging. So obviously we've come quite a long way. Today we have machines like these. Um, it's a dual socket Cadmium Thunder X with 96 cores and a lot of high speed I.O. And when we talk about virtualization performance in modern day computing, it's not enough that we just execute uh, most instructions for virtual machines natively. We also have to be fast when the hypervisor has to support the VM for doing things like fast I.O. or interprocessor communication between your 96 cores. So back in the day, we did virtualization with um, trap and emulate on virtualizable architectures. Right. We did that by running the hypervisor in the privileged CPU mode, and we ran all of our VM, including the kernel and user space, in a non-privileged mode. The problem is that some architectures are not what we call virtualizable. In fact, that's what the 1974 paper was about. It gave you a strict set of requirements for when an architecture is virtualizable, and that means that you can do trap and emulate virtualization. ARM and x86 are examples of architectures which are not virtualizable, and what they did is that they introduced hardware support for virtualization, right? And KVM came out as a hypervisor specifically designed to support hardware-assisted virtualization. But the thing about ARM is that the way that ARM designed their hardware support for virtualization was very, very different from what Intel did. So if we look at a conceptualized version of what Intel does, they basically took your entire CPU protection mechanism and all your CPU modes and duplicated that and added a concept of root versus non-root mode really orthogonal to your, uh, to your CPU modes. And root mode was designed to run the hypervisor or native operating systems and non-root mode for running VMs. And then you switch between these two using specialized hardware mechanisms, the VM entries and the VM exits. And what they do is they essentially save and restore all of your state of your CPU into a specialized structure and memory, the VM control structure, the VMCS. ARM did something very different. They decided to build virtualization support into their protection mechanism. So the basic ARM protection mechanism has two execution modes, EL0 to run user space and EL1 to run the kernel. The ARM virtualization extensions add an additional mode, not orthogonal to your CPU modes, but part of that scheme to run hypervisors. It's called EL2. EL2 is a mode specifically designed to run hypervisors and not full operating systems. What does that mean? It means that it has less um, features than EL1 designed to run the kernel. It has reduced virtual memory support and it has very limited support with int to, for interacting with user space in EL0. That works really well for a type 1 hypervisor like Zen because you just write the hypervisor to run in EL2 and you run your VMs, run Linux, in EL1 and EL0. But for KVM, we kind of have to put everything upside down. 
The problem with KVM is that it's integrated with Linux. Linux is a full operating system designed to run in EL1, and KVM can't run VMs on ARM without running something in EL2. So what do we do? Well, the way that KVM ARM works is that it uses something called split mode virtualization, and the idea is that you split the execution of the hypervisor across both EL1 and EL2. But really, this very unfortunate side effect of that is that you're now multiplexing EL1 state between your VM kernel and your host kernel. And interestingly, x86 sort of has to do that too, but they have their fancy hardware mechanisms to multiplex their CPU mode. On ARM, we have to do it in software. Right, and we do that in the part of KVM running down in EL2. So if we consider a hypercall from a VM and see the kind of work we have to do to handle that hypercall, what will happen is that the VM kernel will issue a hypercall instruction that will trap down to EL2, which will switch all of your EL1 state around in software by saving and restoring loads of registers, then return into your host Linux instance, which can handle your hypercall, but then to return to the VM kernel, it has to make another hypercall instruction to enter EL2 again, switch the state around in software, and then return to your VM kernel. So that's obviously a fair amount of work. But what if we could do something like this instead, where we could just run all of Linux with KVM in EL2? That would be really, really great, because then if we have to handle a trap from the VM, we just handle the trap directly, and we return. So obviously the question is, how do we do that? Well, we get hardware to do that. So that's where VAG comes in. VAG is short for the Virtualization Host Extensions, and it's a modification to the ARM architecture present in ARM v8.1. What it does is it allows us to run an unmodified operating system designed to run in EL1 in EL2, okay? That's actually a pretty controversial thing. It gives us five things. First of all, VHE can be completely disabled to provide backwards compatibility. So Zen won't enable VHE and everything works like before. The second thing that VHE gives you is that it expands the functionality of EL2. So if you remember I said that EL2 was specifically designed to only run hypervisors and be limited compared to EL1. Well now you inherit all of the EL1 MMU features. Um, you get a new timer because EL1 has two timers, EL2 only had one, so now you get two, so you have the same. And the end result is that you end up having a corresponding EL2 system register for every EL1 system register, okay? The third thing is that you get support for running user space in EL0 interacting with a kernel directly running in EL2. There actually was sort of a feature called TGE, short for Trap General Exceptions, already prior to VHE but that was designed to run bare metal applications on top of a standalone type one hypervisor. And when I say bare metal applications, what I mean is applications without virtual memory. So the way the architecture was designed, believe it or not, was that if you set this bit and you ran code in EL0, yes, exceptions would go to EL2 instead of EL1 where they normally would, but the MMU would just be disabled. Unfortunate side effect. So with VAG, that no longer happens. Now you can run code in EL0 with virtual memory and you can trapped to the kernel running in EL2. The fourth thing that VHG gives you is that you can use the same page tables in EL2 as EL1. So it used to be that EL2 had a different format for the page tables that could do less things, um, but now you can use the same format. And you also use the page tables that EL2 configures when you run user space applications in EL0, um, because after all, it is the kernel that should decide what uh, page table gets used by user space. And the fifth thing, which is a fun thing, is that we get system register redirection. So the problem is that Linux is written to run in EL1, and I said that EVHG allowed us to run Linux unmodified in EL2, right? But EL1 is controlled by EL1 registers, EL2 is controlled by EL2 registers. So we now have a Linux kernel, which, because it's unmodified, will try to modify EL1 registers to change its execution, to read registers to tell it something, like what caused an exception from user space, for example. Right? And that will be completely useless. So what we really want is we want to have this unmodified Linux kernel that then accesses EL2 registers instead. So let's think about how you access a system register on ARM, or ARM64. Well, you execute an instruction which has an assembly name, 
But really, that assembly name is just a name that ties to a certain instruction encoding, right? So that name tells you that you're going to read an EL1 register, OK? Um, but we can actually decouple that, right? And that's exactly what VHE does. So when VHE is disabled, things work like before. You execute this instruction. You read an EL1 register. But when you enable VHE and you're in EL2 and you execute this instruction, you read an EL2 register instead. This tends to confuse people. Um, but what if you actually did want to read the EL1 register? You can't use the instruction that normally says you read an EL1 register because we just said we changed it to go to an EL2 register instead, right? And sometimes we do want to read an EL1 register, for example, if you want to run a VM. So you get a new set of instructions for that. That's the EL12 instructions, right? And they always access the EL1 register. And they're called that way. Um, I think the idea is you access the EL1 register from EL2. So that's the thing you need to think about. Um, but wait, there's more because some registers are, don't have the same format between EL1 and EL2. They have the same, uh, they control the same things, but their bit positions might be shifted or have slightly different semantics, so you need to set two in one case and only one bit in another case and so on. Um, so all the registers where you have uh, the, sim the same bit layout, it's the, the register redirection is pretty trivial. But when you have different registers, what do you do? Well, the hardware just says, well, when you enable VHG, we're just gonna change the meaning of the EL2 register, shift it around. So <clears throat> with VHG, we can run Linux in EL2 unmodified, and that's great. But KVM has to actually be modified to work, to just work with, with VHG. So if we go back to our legacy split mode KVM ARM design, what we had to do there is when Linux decided to run a VM, basically because you call an iOctal from user space, you would run some code in KVM as part of Linux, and then you would issue a trap to enter the part of KVM running in EL2, and then you would eventually run your VM. Slightly oversimplified, all we have to do to make KVM work with VHE is we have to change a bunch of instructions that we're accessing EL1 registers to use the new EL1.2 accessors, and we have to change the trap to a function call. Now everything runs in EL2, and you're golden. The problem is we don't have any VHE hardware, so we have no clue how this is going to perform. Some VHE hardware is beginning to appear, but there's really nothing publicly available yet. We can't really use software models to validly uh, evaluate performance. So what do we do? Well, what we did was we modified Linux to run in EL2. So that would give you a good measure for how um, VHE would perform. On current hardware that doesn't have VHE, right? And what we do is we modify Linux to access EL2 registers instead of EL1 registers, to use the EL2 special virtual memory subsystem instead of the EL1 one, um, and we figure out a way to deal with exceptions from user space running in EL0. The system register access thing is um, pretty easy, or pretty crude as well. We just use an ifdef. You could use you know, an alternative instruction patching, at least for stuff that's running after the alternatives are up. Um, we didn't bother for this, the purpose of what we're doing. The second challenge is memory, and there's, that, that's an interesting one. So if we look at um, the EL1 virtual memory subsystem on ARM, and assume a 39 bits virtual address space, it looks something like this. You have two distinct virtual address regions using separate page tables with separate page table based registers. And the way Linux uses that is the upper range is used for the kernel and the lower range is used for user space. In EL2, you only have one. So the question is, where do we put the kernel and where do we put user space? What we do is we split the VA between kernel and user space um, using page tables similar to what you do in x86. So you have an upper page table level pointing to some uh, shared lower level page tables for the kernel, which are then used across all processes. But there are some problems with doing that with Linux running in EL2. First of all, we compress the address space. You have obviously have less address space available than if you ran in EL1. Um, the page table formats are really not designed to do what we're trying to do here. And um, you end up having to invalidate the TLB a lot more than you would normally. So I want to stress that this is only a problem on non-VHE hardware when you run Linux in EL2, not on VHE. So this thing about the page tables, the thing is we're going to use the same page table between the kernel and user space, but we're going to run 
user space and the kernel in two different modes, EL0 and EL2. And these modes are really designed to have different page table formats. So that means they will interpret the page tables differently. Okay? So these three bits, the AP1 bit, UXN, XN, and PXN bits, are interpreted in different ways between EL0 and EL2. And that gives us some problems. The AP1 bit basically says if it's set, user space can access a page. If it's not set, it cannot. That means we obviously have to set it to zero for kernel mappings, right? Because otherwise user space can access the kernel. We don't want that. But the architecture says, well, this bit is res one. So that really means reserved one. So you sort of feel like, well, you have to write a one. What happens if we put zero when we read that page table from the kernel? So we look into that. And we say for ARMv8.0 specifically, there's no guarantees that this will work on future hardware, but we don't care about that. Um, what it really means is that it should be read as written with no effect on the behavior of the CPU. So a kernel in EL2 should be able to write a zero into that page table entry and read back a zero, and it shouldn't affect the CPU. Okay, we don't care. Uh, and actually, it works on all the systems we run on. There are two more bits we have to worry about. The PXN bit means privileged execute never, and it's used to say, okay, this page can't, cannot be executed from the kernel if you, the kernel runs in EL1. But since we don't run anything in EL1, and it only affects EL1, we don't, it doesn't matter what we set it to. The UXN XN means execute never, and it results, the result is it works the same way in both modes. So basically, we don't have any way to say this page is executable in one mode and not the other. You either decide if a page is executable, and then it becomes executable by both user space and the kernel. Okay? That's potentially bad for two reasons. First of all, you don't have that privileged execute never functionality, so you don't have any protection against return to user attacks beyond your kernel being correct. And um, it also means that user space can execute kernel code by just jumping to an address. Okay? That sounds scary. It can only execute kernel code with user mode privileges, though, and it can't read or write kernel code. So it's sort of similar to doing dot slash on VM Linux. Um, but yeah, I mean, the best I can say is that it's not more secure. Another problem is we don't have ACIDs in EL2. So address space identifiers is this thing where depending on your context, you can attach a tag to uh, entries in your TLB. And that avoids conflicts in the TLB if you access multiple virtual addresses that map to different physical addresses in different contexts. It's not really a problem for the kernel because it's global ac across all processes. But when you do get user or put user, you start accessing user space addresses, right? And they can uh, have conflicts. So if you run your kernel on EL1 as normal, you will uh, use the ACID of the process you're executing under. But in EL2, EL2 just doesn't use it, doesn't use ACID. So you have to invalidate all of the EL2 entries in the TLB every time you switch um, a process on the host. And then, the third challenge was this thing about running user space on top of a kernel in EL2. So we generally want to take and handle exceptions in our kernel, no matter where it runs, right? So if you take an exception from user space, you want it to go to the kernel if it runs in EL1. If you take an exception from within the kernel itself, you also want that to go to the kernel in EL1, right? Same thing if you run the kernel in EL2. But the hardware will uh, route a lot of exceptions to EL1. It's really tempting to use that trap general exceptions bit, but as I told you before, it disables virtual memory in user space, which sucks. So what we do is we install a little shim, which is basically a one page of code that just in software forwards the exception from EL1 down to EL2, and then we modify the exception entry path in the, um, in the EL2 kernel to figure out that, oh, this exception really came from EL0, but it looks like it comes from EL1 and so on. So, the bad news about Linux in EL2 is that it's less secure than Linux in EL1. It relies on a strictly um, correct interpretation of the architecture when you implement your CPU. And it potentially gives you worse performance for host workloads, right? That's why I'm not trying to upstream this or argue that this is something you want to use in production. But the good news is that it's a really good prototyping tool and it's allowed us to optimize KVM ARM before we had VHE hardware for VHE because it very closely emulates the performance of uh, what a current system that had VAG would, would be. So 
to measure how that then performs, we used an MDC Atl for this work, and we ran some numbers. So if we look at the cost of a hypercall, so a hypercall is a good little micro benchmark, right? Because it gives you the basic transition cost of going from the VM to the hypervisor and back. So this uh, table here shows you clock cycles between the first column, which is the unoptimized KVM ARM version without VAG, and the second one is emulating VAG performance with Linux running in EL2. Right? And it's a little bit of a disappointing result. We only get like about 100 cycles improvement. Right? So what the heck? Um, the reason is really that all we really did in terms of KVM performance was we changed the trap to a function call. And that gives you about those 100 cycles, and that's about it. So what we have to do is we have to more fundamentally change the design of KVM ARM um, to improve performance and take advantage of VAG, of running in, in EL2. So if we look at the KVM run loop, right, what it is, it's a, it's a loop inside the kernel that loops around. And for every iteration of the loop, you run guest code directly on the CPU. Right? And the idea is if we want to be able to quickly support our, our VM for doing things like um, interprocessor interrupts or doing fast I.O., we want to do as little work as possible for each iteration of the loop, because then we execute more, we spend more time executing code on the, uh, in the guest, and we're quicker to, to service the VM. So we can make this loop do less work by moving logic into the vCPU load and vCPU put functions. So what these functions are, they're hooks that are called when you enter the run loop and when you exit the run loop. And they're also called by preempt notifiers if your threat gets scheduled off the system and when it gets scheduled back in. So the general approach is that we uh, move hardware configuration logic out of the run loop into vCPU load and vCPU put. And that's really only possible when you run your kernel in EL2, because if you try to do this when you ran the kernel in EL1, you'd be stepping on your own state and potentially panicking your host kernel. So let's take a look at some examples of the stuff we did using this technique. So we can start with the timers. So the ARM generic timers is a... Is the official name of timers for the ARM architecture. That's what they're called in the architecture document. We call them most often uh, the architecture timers or the arch timers. The reason for that is that there used to be this um, mess of ARM systems that had all sorts of random uh, peripherals as timers just attached to your system. And at some point, ARM came around and said, let's build some timer functionality into the architecture. And uh, therefore, people started calling it architecture timers as opposed to the non-architecture timers. So that's what the name in the code as well, if you go look. What they give you is that they allow um, guests to directly program timer hardware to enable and disable timers to change the deadline of when the timer is going to fire. But when the timer then does fire, that just generates a normal physical interrupt, which always traps to the hypervisor, and the hypervisor has to deal with it somehow. The way we used timers in KVM ARM was a little bit interesting, though. What we did is, on every entry to the guest, we took the guest state from memory and programmed that into the hardware. Then we were running the, the guest, and the guest could mess around with the timers without trapping to the hypervisor. And then when we exited from the VM, before we enabled interrupts, we would capture all the state from the hardware, write it into memory, disable the timer, and never actually take any interrupt or handle any interrupt, and then figure out in software if we needed to inject a timer into the guest. With optimized KVM ARM, what we do is, at vCPU load time, we program the timer with the guest state. Again, when the vCPU is running, um, the guest can program the timer without exiting to the hypervisor. When the timer then fires, we don't disable it. We just enable interrupts on the host. And now we can handle interrupts on the host side and inject virtual interrupts to the guest directly from the ISR. And the benefit here is that we end up doing no work on vCPU entry and vCPU exit. We also improve how we handle EL1 system registers. We avoid saving and restoring the EL1 state every time we go between um, the VM and the hypervisor, because we now can do that in vCPU load and vCPU put. Another thing we do is we stop enabling and disabling virtualization features or traps every time we go from the hypervisor to the VM. So why did we do that before? Well, you had your host Linux instance running in EL1, and you had your VM kernel running in EL1, you didn't want your VM kernel to be able to manage your underlying hardware or access all memory on your system, but you did want your host kernel to be able to do that. So the way we did that was whenever we entered the VM, we said, let's enable stage two memory translation. 
Uh, and when we came back, we disabled it. So we essentially made the host Linux instance more privileged than the VM kernel, even though they're running in the same CPU mode. Okay? In the optimized version, we just configure the hardware once, and we never touch it again. And why can we do that? Well, that's because EL2 is never affected by the um, configuration of the virtualization features. It never really traps. And EL0 um, follows that when it runs with TG as part of the host Linux context. Finally, we in completely rewrote what we call our well switch code. So our well switch code is essentially the software implementation of the VM entry and VM exits on x86. Um, so basically what we do is we have a single static key in the run loop that says if you're on a VHG system, call this function. If you're not on a VHG system, then make a hypercall instruction and jump into EL2 and run another function. The VHG function ends up being very, very simple. It only switches a few rest registers around, and that's it. The non-VHG one is pretty complicated. We actually tried first just um, conditionalizing and using static keys all over for the, um, for the non-VHG version, but we just couldn't get it as fast. So with our redesigned and optimized a new and improved KVM ARM, um, we then also measure performance. This time we also provide some x86 results as a baseline comparison, and we used a Xeon E5-2450 for that. And any workloads that involve the client on a server use 10 gig Ethernet with VFIO pass-through. And we always made sure that the client wasn't saturated and we configured all VMs and hosts um, in very similar ways, using exactly the same software setup, same kernel configuration, and so on. So these numbers, again, show cycles, so we can try to compare across architectures and across differently clocked platforms. And what you have here is you have our non-VHG legacy result, we have our optimized KVM ARM result, and we have x86 as a comparison. So we see that we get more than a 75% reduction in the overhead, co overhead co in the hypercall cost, which is pretty awesome. We go from around 3,000 cycles to 750. IO kernel is the cost of accessing an IO device from a VM kernel uh, in, the, in the host kernel, like accessing your interrupt controller. And it goes from around 4,000 cycles to 1,600, so also pretty good. IO user actually goes up a little bit, and that's because we do a lot of work in vCPU put. And then virtual IPI goes from 14,000 cycles to around 2,500 cycles. That's a really, really important result. We also see that ARM actually ends up doing a little bit better than x86 in some of these results. That's also interesting. We also looked at some real applications. Uh, so we ran, you know, current bench to measure CPU intensive workload, uh, hack bench, uh, which really ends up measuring IPI performance because Linux really likes to do IPIs when you do something with the scheduler. Net perf in various configurations to measure network performance, uh, Apache to measure how net, uh, web server performs, and memcached configured to be really, really latency sensitive. So it looks like this. So the blue bars here are our non-VHE result, the green bars is our optimized, great KVM ARM hypervisor, and the yellow bars is x86 for comparison. This slide shows overhead, so virtualized performance normalized to one for native performance. So lower here is better and means less overhead, okay? <clears throat> so we basically see that for most network-related benchmarks that had overhead before, and for Hackbench, we reduced the cost by about 50%. And we also see that we reduce a latency-sensitive workload overhead to one-fifth of what it was before. And if we compare optimized KVM ARM with x86, some cases x86 is a little better, some cases ARM is a little bit better, but we're sort of leveling the playing field. So, in conclusion, we had to pretty significantly redesign and um, re-implement KVM ARM to optimize it, and that gives us some significant performance improvements for both micro uh, and real application level benchmarks. We end up having similar or better performance characteristics compared to x86, and this work is published in Usenix this year, so if you want to go read a lengthy analysis of the results, I recommend that you read the paper. In terms of code, we already have v4 of the timer optimization patches on the list. 
The core optimization patches are in their first version. They're on the list. The whole Linux and EL2 thing is hosted on GitHub. Disclaimer, it's completely unsupported. Like, you can look at it, you can have fun with it, play with it. It, it works on the kernel version that's there, but I don't plan on doing more work on it. I hope to upstream the first two um, by 4.16, but it you know, depends on how things will go. And then, here's the thing. If you feel really, really sad because you missed your chance to review the ARM64 hypervisor implementation the first time Mark did it, or when he did it the second time, when he rewrote all the assembly code into C code, and you just can't get over the fact that you missed the chance, right? Then here it is. Here's your final chance to review core ARM64 hypervisor implementations, OK? It's a gift from me to you. And uh, that's it. Thanks for listening. Any questions? Nobody's wondering why it became more expensive to go to EL1, um, or sorry, to go back to user space when you did a, uh, an IO user access after the optimizations. We moved logic from the run loop out into vCPU put, right? But it's the same logic, so why did it become more expensive? The reason is that um, we have to set up this exception forwarding shim in EL1, right? So we actually end up having to restore more state than we did before. And um, we don't actually expect that number to be as high on real VHG systems because you don't have to do that work. There's a question in the back and one here. Uh, just uh, at the end, when you compare the application and workload, do you, uh, I, I see you look at, you use uh, x86, right? Is that because you, you treat x86 as a speed of light or, or like there's other concern? Because I was curious if you have the number of a Zen, because Zen is a type one, right? I mean, as you said, a type one, you don't have to do much modification. So sorry, you, I didn't hear your question about x86. So You're I'm like, just basically curious if you have the number of a, a, when, the, when you run the application on Zen. Um, as part of this work, I didn't actually compare against Zen, but I did do a performance study before of KVM ARM before it was optimized against Zen. Um, and uh, there's a paper from ISCA last year um, which outlines that. And what that actually really shows is that uh, Zen, Zen ends up performing worse without pass through um, if you do uh, VertIO or Zen PV than KVM ARM when KVM ARM was not optimized yet. Um, so for pass-through, I, I don't know how the, the picture will look ex exactly, but I don't know how, the, how it will look uh, on future hardware. My bet is KVM will do better. But. Does that answer the question? There was a question here? Oh, uh, I want to ask, you are comparing with x86 performing. So you already had two, three iterations of work, so you're still trying more, or you're just done with, by comparing with x86 and whatever numbers you, are, uh, you have caught and you're okay with that? So the question is if I'm planning on doing more experiments with more results on yeah. x86 and ARM, basically? Yeah. As soon as I get my hands on VSE hardware, I'd love to do some more uh, measurements. Okay, thank you.